You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Whites. Greetings and welcome to the BH Photography Podcast. Back in September 2018, we recorded a show celebrating the 20th anniversary of a photograph titled A Great Day in Hip Hop. The photograph, which was organized by Double XL Magazine, was taken by the legendary photographer Gordon Parks and featured close to 200 of the world's premier hip hop artists. The photograph Parks took that day was itself a celebration of another group portrait photographer Art Kane took at that very same location 40 years earlier. Kane's photograph, now commonly known as A Great Day in Harlem, featured 57 of the world's best jazz musicians of the day and was taken for Esquire magazine. The photograph has been both celebrated and imitated ever since. It's the definition of an iconic photograph. Jonathan Kane, Art's son, was scheduled to be with us for the recording in September, but was unable to join us. However, we really wanted to speak about this legendary photograph that his father took, so we asked Jonathan to join us for this episode about jazz photography. And in the second half of the show, we're going to be speaking with contemporary jazz photographer Clara Pereira about her work and shooting techniques. But now we welcome Jonathan Kane. Jonathan Kane is a photographer, director, musician, and a composer. His photo and video work concentrates on the automotive and trucking industries, and as a musician, he has credits on over 60 records, and he's a founding member of the band Swans. Jonathan, along with his late wife, Holly Anderson, has produced a newly released book titled Art Kane, Harlem 1958, a 60th anniversary edition, with a foreword by Quincy Jones and commentary by the legendary Benny Golson, who appears in the original photograph, Jonathan's book is a historic document that depicts an iconic day in the worlds of photography and music. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank Here's you. a question for you. You were only two years old when the Great Dane Hall was taken. What's your earliest memory of the photograph, and when did you first recognize its historical value? Well, my, my dad always had the picture hanging in his studio, uh, along with uh, many of his other, uh, what, what I would refer to as greatest hits or some of his yeah. favorite uh, pictures, and he had, he had a number of them. But, but Harlem 1958, which, by the way, the, the, is the actual name of the photograph is Harlem 1958, um, and, uh, and it's become affectionately known by the name of Gene Bach's documentary film, a great day in Harlem has become its second name. So, ah, so, okay. um, so I, I had always been seeing the picture uh, around my dad's studio and, and was aware of it as a small kid, but didn't really uh, know until I got a little bit older, uh, just exactly how important so many of those artists were. And as I, as I grew and developed as a, as a musician and music fan, I was always in awe, you know, of of uh, the presence of of legendary artists in that photo, like Count Basie and Coleman Hawkins and Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie and Benny Golson, and the list goes on and on. Of course. And were you were you aware as a as a young teenager, or is this something you kind of came back to when you were in your twenties and you already had your musical career going? Yeah. No. I mean, I I. I uh, as as a young guy, I kind of rejected the music of my generation right. and became interested in blues and jazz at about the age of eleven. Okay. So by that point, I knew what my father had done, and and at that time, he was photographing some really kind of historic photographs in rock music, like his photo of the Who wrapped up in the British flag, which is another iconic music image. And uh, and my dad always brought me um, souvenirs and artifacts. I, I had a pair of Keith Moon's drumsticks from that shoot, but I, I was <laughs> relatively unimpressed with that and actually just used them and played on them until they broke and then threw them away because <laughs> I would have been more excited if he had a pair of Joe Jones's drumsticks for me. Right. Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> of course, That's... I regret doing that now. Would I like to still have a pair of Keith Moon's drumsticks? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're young, you're a little... Uh, you know, you, you know, you have your your the, the arrogance of youth and all that stuff. But know? but that photo was was always around the the great the Harlem the nineteen fifty eight. It was a it part of your life, right? I mean, very very much so, very much so. Yeah. And yeah. Did, did your father 
keep it out as a point of pride? Was it something that you know he referred to as one of his greatest photos or one of his biggest moments? Or, or I mean, he, I think for him it was a, it was a really foundational moment in his career um, that he was extremely proud of. But but Art Kane didn't do a lot of looking back. Mm. He was always about his next shoot and what he was going to do next and how he was going to change things and evolve. Uh, uh, evolved his own approach and photography in general. So, but yes, he was certainly proud of it. And later, uh, at his third third of his three New York studios, which was um, on Prince Street and Broadway, um, he had a, a, a big framed print of of uh, Harlem 1958 in the foyer. Well, first thing you'd walk in, you'd see it there. And um, and actually, cavalierly, a lot of messengers would lean their bikes against it and all. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I have it now. I'm staring at it, and uh, it's in my home. And uh, we finally covered it up uh, because it's a little bit dinged up, which, of course, just adds to the history of it. But, yeah, to answer your question, my dad was proud of the picture and uh, and um, and considered it a real turning point in his career because that, that was the moment. So there is, there is this creation myth that Harlem 1958 is Art Kane's first photograph, that he was an amateur photographer. Right, right. And, and that's that's um, that's a story that Art Kane himself, uh, you know, um, allowed to to uh, to flourish. But the the reality is is that Art Kane actually uh, had been shooting. He was not a professional photographer. He was an art director. Is that correct? Magazine art right. director. Yeah, that's exactly correct. He was actually a very highly celebrated art director. But he was becoming restless and 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 had a lot to say as a as a photographer but uh, hadn't yet launched his career. But he had actually been placing photographs. And um, there's, a, there's a record, uh, one of the largest selling records in jazz up to that time in 1955 was, is, uh, is uh, Errol Garner's Concert by the Sea. And uh, it was released in 1955. And that's got an Art Kane photograph on the cover. Uh, so yes, before Harlem 58, he actually was shooting but he had not officially launched his career as a photographer yet. Got it. The new book is 168 pages. Um, now, the photograph is one photograph large. Uh, <laughs> it's a spectacular picture, but you have a 168-page book about a photograph. Was there a lot of support imagery to go along with? There were a lot of pictures taken behind the scenes by uh, just passerbys, photographers, musicians, or whatever. What's, what, what kind of other visuals are in this book? Well, so there, there's a couple of photos um, that were taken by uh, by the bass player Milt Hinton, who is actually in the photograph. And Milt Hinton himself was a very accomplished photographer who who uh, photographed um, a lot of the recording sessions and tour experience he he had in his epic career. And so Milt had his photograph, uh, his camera with him and was shooting. And in fact, Milt Hinton had given his wife, Mona Hinton, uh, a Super 8 camera to uh, shoot some footage of that day. And, and, and that footage was, in fact, the genesis of Gene Bach's film, A Great Day in Harlem, uh, where you actually see this image, this, this historic and iconic image come to life in beautiful, grainy, super eight color footage. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but in our book, Harlem 1958, the focus is on all of Art Kane's outtakes and not, uh, not really about anybody else's. It's about what Art Kane was looking at that day through his lens and his camera. And, um, and, and I, I have to point out that it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a special kind of event to look at Art Kane's outtakes. Art Kane didn't really like outtakes he didn't believe them in them he didn't save that very many of them um the large body of art kane's work was was color photography more so than black and white and and, and his his medium of choice was kodachrome uh uh transparencies and uh, of which he would sit and fill garbage cans with all of his rejects the ones he didn't care <laughs> like Sounds literally like just, <laughs> yeah <laughs> literally saving a handful of of, of pictures uh, from each shoot now black and white as we know is a different format you've got strips of negatives and you couldn't it would not so easy to sit there and cut the 
your your keepers out and get rid of the rest. So the the black and white shoots tend to exist, um, you know, in in a much more comprehensive form. And I and even though I don't usually let them go in the, in the case of this photograph, it's it's different. Uh, even though Art Kane was all about his main shot, this photograph um, has taken on a life of its own. That's that's I think to me is even larger than than even his original intention. Mm-hmm. And and that's in in large part because of these 58, um, well, 57 in the photograph. There's one artist who was there who didn't get into the actual frame. <laughs> Willie the Lion Smith had gotten tired and was sitting on the stoop next door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but And he, he's featured in some of the outtakes. You can see, yeah, but he, he didn't make it into that actual one. But at any rate, um, it, it's those 58 musicians who showed up that day. This picture is as much about them and their story as it is about Arcane's vision to make it happen. And, and that's why I think it's important that, to see all the objects. Plus, many of them are beautiful. You know, they're, and what, they're, what are the actual – now, you have one key photograph. Um, is it safe to assume that the picture we're talking about is only one image? Because you're mentioning there's a lot of outtakes that I imagine a lot of them are similar to the picture yeah. that we're, we're – Based, we're, we're basically talking about. Are there a lot of variations of that? And did you ever see any that you actually might like better? I, I can't look. I, I can't second guess Art Kane's edit. And in fact, the the classic is the classic for a lot of reasons. It's sort of like listening to second and third takes of Sergeant Pepper. You know, it's fascinating to hear the other versions of it, but you know, the, 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 the classic is a classic for a reason. Um, but, but at the same time, it's, it's wonderful to look at these outtakes. Uh, there's different, slightly different arrangements of the musicians. There's also the revelation that at one point, uh, they moved the location to another building further down, uh, at 17 East 126th Street, but another point they moved between Madison and Park to 52 East 126th Street. And I, I, I re- realized that in this deep dive into looking at all the outtakes. It's like, wait a second, that's a different building there in hmm. front of. Well, that's pretty interesting so, given that that location has been used for you know other photos since then. Yeah, it is. It has. Well, I mean, you know, I think they were trying a different trying. So what what's fascinating to me is the idea of those 58 people walking together, mm-hmm. you know, as a huge group and crossing, uh, crossing Madison Avenue together, you totally. know, and, which, and, and, and there's no, no one really knows or remembers like which location came first. I see. So there's certain <laughs> mysteries in it. So to your question, yes, there's, there's a lot of pictures that are the same kind of formation, but they all have slight differences in the arrangements of the people. And then there's a lot of smaller groups and um, individual shots where my, when people were just kind of getting settled in and getting ready, where Art Kane was walking around with his camera and doing some smaller pairings of people shaking hands and mm. talking and laughing and just having a heck of a time. And there's, there's photos with people uh, of the neighborhood kind of looking and involved. There's some fascinating historical moments like um, uh, there's a couple of different horse-drawn carriages that uh, horse-drawn carts that go by the scene with like a pile of old mattresses on one and like a <laughs> rag man on another. Mm-hmm. And so here you are, it's 1958 in New York City and there's still business being done on horseback, uh, you know, with, with a horse-drawn cart, which is fascinating. So seeing moments like that help create this uh, further understanding of what that day was like. You know, and it's all crystallized in his final historic photo, but it is a fascinating and thrilling thing to understand what else was going on leading up to that that historic click. What camera did Art use? Do you know? Yes. So that's a great question. Um, it was, he, he borrowed the camera <laughs> and it was um, something called a Contax, a 35 mm, sure. But he was also shooting medium format, and I don't, honestly don't know. It, it, I doubt it was a Hasselblad, um, and I don't honestly know what the medium format camera was. The thing is, it was all, all borrowed equipment, and there's a lot of laughs in my father's telling of the tale about how um, – uh, he and his assistant barely knew how to load the film into the <laughs> camera and, you know, were goofing around. And so the medium format stuff is great, but, you know, 35 millimeter became Art Kane's, uh, uh, you know, axe of choice, as it were. Right. 
and um, and it was in fact it was a Contax camera. Was there ever a thought of uh, of doing the image in color? I mean, given his style and uh, you know, the, I guess the the importance of the moment. I really don't think so. Yeah. I think he was fully inten- intended to to because the other photographs in the essay of Esquire that accompanied the uh, Harlem 1958 included um, uh, really groundbreaking uh, conceptual environmental portraiture by Art Kane of Louis Armstrong, mm-hmm. Duke Ellington, um, and uh, L- Lester Young, and Charlie Parker's tombstone, and those are all in color. Um, and I'm, I, I'm sure that he just knew that he, this photo had to be black and white and that's how he shot it. Right, right. I can't imagine it in color actually. Yeah. I think it would be, this well, is a not timelessness. a, yeah. Yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. Um, can you walk us through a little bit it, it, what you know of any way of like the, the concept and, you know, his idea, was it, you know, all his idea, was there any kind of struggle to get it published, uh, or to get, you know, to get the go ahead to for the production and, sure. uh, and, and some of the organizational aspects of it. Sure. Absolutely. Well, so, so here's the scenario is it's, it's, it's 1958 and Art Kane is a celebrated art director who's dipping his, uh, his feet into the waters of photography with, with placing some images here and there, like the Errol Garner album cover, but he really wants to make a change in his life now being, uh, and, and, and move into photography full time now being, you know, uh, a, a, a high level art director on the scene. He's got the word about what's going on in the industry. And he found out uh, I'm not exactly sure where, but he found out that Esquire magazine was planning a big issue on jazz, and uh, and it was going to be a big kind of blowout celebration issue for their January 1959 issue. So I think Art Kane decided if I, if I could pitch something and get the gig and do something really outrageous, maybe I could get this gig, and maybe that could be like a great way to launch my career as a photographer. So he cooked up this idea. It was it was his idea, hundred percent, to uh, m- put an open call and do a jazz uh, group portrait, a sort of a class photo, as it were, of as many generations of jazz representing, uh, you know, uh, you know, different eras and different d- styles and developments in the form, uh, and and he wanted to do it live, so uh, live and, and 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 on location in Harlem. So um, you know, he went, he took an appointment with. Uh, with uh, Harold Hayes, who was the editor at Esquire at the time, and Robert Benton, who went on to become a uh-huh. Hollywood filmmaker. director, yeah. Yeah, filmmaker, um, and and uh, Benton at time was at the time was the art director at Esquire. So Art Kane took a meeting with them and and pitched this concept, and uh, and they both went, wow. This is an incredible idea. They were a little nervous. They try, my understanding is they tried to convince him to do it in a studio where they'd be able to control it. And that Art Kane was like, nope, absolutely not. This has got to happen in Harlem. Harlem is where jazz came in in New York City. And it's where the, most of these artists live and work. And uh, it, it's got to be in Harlem. And uh, so uh, Benton says very famously uh, in the in the documentary film A Great Day in Harlem, he goes, well, that's when I started to get a little nervous, he said, because, you know, so many things can go wrong, sure. you know, location, you, you, anything from no shows to the to terrible weather and who knows what's going to happen. But um, but they signed off on it and um, and then they went about they began the, the business of recruiting and um and, and making the arrangements. I imagine at that point, my dad went out on uh, location scouting and found the building uh, and or as we understand now from our new book, the buildings, plural. Um, and um, I tell you the truth, I, there's not a lot of record keeping. I, I, I assume they had a permit. I know nowadays you can't shoot. uh you can't do a shoot in New York City with one person standing on a street corner without a permit for it, you know, if, uh, if it's a commercial shoot. Uh, I do see in some of the outtakes some police presence uh, standing around. Um, but whether this – I don't believe that the street was closed off. The word started going around this. So basically uh, my dad and, 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 uh, and the folks at Esquire began a campaign of calling all of the uh, uh, jazz agents – record companies, uh, club owners, the, they were postings at the union hall I've heard. And, um, and they just started putting the word out 
in the jazz community that Esquire was calling for everyone in jazz to show up at 17 uh, East uh, 126th Street hmm. at 10 o'clock on the morning of Saturday, August. Uh, that that date that date is uh, in, in is contested and questioned. Um, so I'm just oh, really? I just go with I just go with August 1958 myself. Okay. All right. um, uh, and, uh, and then they just, uh, sat back and crossed their fingers, you know, I mean, they did everything they could, but then at the end of the day that nobody had any idea really, hmm. um, who would show up, uh, would it, would they get 10 people? Would they get 20? Would they get five? Really? They just they really, didn't know. <laughs> you know, this is, this is so far before, you know, sure. RS. Uh, before you know, uh, e email and uh, you know, no, nobody knew. They sent the word out, and then they just sat back and waited and hoped. Right, and, and, it, uh, and it's also kind of famously recognized that you know it, it's ten thirty in the morning, and that's very, very early for most jazz performers. <laughs> yeah, that, that's like bedtime. <laughs> that's, that's right, exactly. That is bedtime. Yeah, yeah uh, somebody else in the movie says, "I never knew there were two two ten o'clocks in the day." <laughs> right, right. Were there any? Uh, I don't want to say famous no shows, but people that maybe Art was hoping specifically were, that were going to show but didn't make it, or did people show up that were not? I, I guess it's hard to say who was expected, but you know that all of a sudden. Were there any somebody, people who had no I business mean, being Basie in the picture? Up, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, look, that's I I I would say the I would say to that second question, no. I think there's some young people, and I'm going to tell you a story, a true story about a young lion in the photograph in one second uh, and how he came to be there because it's a great story and it's mm -hmm. a personal story as well. Good. But in terms of the no-shows and the who's not there, look, I mean, of course there are people who we all could dream and hope should have been there, but you know yeah. what? Like it's acknowledged, like – as you know, I'm a musician. I actually bumped into um, into Max Roach at a gig in Portugal a few years ago, a uh, number of years ago at this point, and I uh, was talking to him in an elevator uh, in Lisbon, and, say, and we were talking about my dad's photograph, and he goes, yeah, I always wanted to be there, but I was on tour with Miles. Right. So <laughs> there you go. You know, I mean, it's yeah. like, yes, some, not everybody. I mean, come on. They got 58 of the biggest names in jazz. I think that's uh, sure. Would it have been wonderful if Coltrane could have been there or Billie Holiday? Or, you know, of course, of course it would. But, you know, it's it's uh, it's it, it is it is a beautiful thing as it is. Now, just and to your other question, standing to the far left of the photograph, he's actually the third uh, musician standing, third from left, is uh, uh, the drummer Eddie Locke. And he's standing next to Horace Silver, who's wearing a white jacket and a dark colored shirt. But El Eddie is wearing like a beige suit. So Eddie Locke told me this story personally at the premiere of the of Gene Box film A Great Day in Harlem in 1995. So he said he was a new arrival to New York, recently arrived in New York and trying to get established. He had done a few gigs, but he was really just getting started. Now, he had a son or daughter, I'm not sure that it was a son or he had a child in nursery school in Washington Heights. And apparently, uh, Eddie Locke's classmate was my older brother, Anthony Kane. <laughs> who was four years old at the time. Uh, Eddie Locke told me he was there uh, at the nursery school to pick up his child after school where he met my mom, uh, who is uh, the woman on the cover of, uh, <laughs> of Errol Gardner's Concert by the Sea. Oh, um, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, he got into a casual conversation with my mom. They were talking about their lives and some basic, you know, friendly chit-chat and... Uh, and it came up that he was a jazz musician. He played drums and he was a jazz musician. And my mom, June Kane, said, oh, well, you know, this weekend my husband is taking a big jazz group portrait for Esquire magazine. Uh, she said, you should go. And so um, he said, uh, wow, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, got the details from her about the when and the where. And he went on to tell me he showed up at 10 o'clock that morning and came around the corner of 126th Street and nearly fainted. He said he turned the corner and suddenly saw, you know, his heroes, mm -hmm. 
Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie, Lester Young, Coleman, Hawkins, Charles Mingus, um, Joe Jones, Sonny Greer. I mean, for a young drummer, seeing that Gene Krupa, you know, he mm-hmm. was and he said his knees were knocking and that he nearly turned around and fled. <laughs> thinking like, <laughs> thinking like, there, man, yeah. I don't belong here. Right. I, I'm, and then, but then he spied uh, Horace Silver, who he knew. He was another young lion, uh, an up and coming musician, an artist. And, uh, and I guess he had maybe done some gigs or done some playing with Horace and he had a relay. So he went over, stood with Horace and took his place in history. And, and so therefore Eddie Locke was not there thanks to a record company executive mm-hmm. or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, a producer or, a agent, uh, or even from a notice at a union hall, but he was there by a chance encounter with uh, with the beautiful young woman on the cover of Concert by the <laughs> Sea, who happened to be Art Kane's wife yeah. and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question: Do you know how long the the whole shoot lasted? I do not know precisely, but right. I think it probably no more than a couple hours for the mm-hmm. whole thing. Right, yeah. right, right. You know what? You mentioned Dizzy Gillespie, and there's a one of the outtakes I saw that he had a camera around his neck uh, during at least. I don't know, actually during the photo itself, but maybe in the prep time, he was taking some shots also. Absolutely. Um, and there, there's a couple of other people who had some cameras around. Um, but uh, the, the best outtakes from it are, are Milt Hinton. So right. I don't know if I've ever seen any of Dizzy's pictures. I don't know, maybe, you know, who whatever knows? came of them. And, uh, Let me know. ask, can I ask how, how did this photo affect Art's career? Was it something that... Uh, you know, established him, put him on the map, and or was it? Uh, did he have to kind of then, you know, build from there? No, I mean, uh, the 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 thing is, when this Esquire essay came out, of which Harlem 1958 was the centerpiece. But I, I but it's very important to point out that the other photographs were equally important in terms of Art Kane's impact on the on the uh, on the art and craft of photography. Uh, because the other photographs are really much more where Art Kane, you know, made a huge, another kind of huge statement, and that is as a conceptual photographer. For for example, you know, how many, uh, there have been millions of wonderful photographs of Louis Armstrong playing his horn and uh, and and on stage and any number of things, but Art Kane took him on in a four seat Cessna and flew him out to death Valley and put him in with a rocking chair <laughs> and had him sitting in a rocking chair in, in the middle of death Valley as to, to, uh, to make a statement about a man who had created a musical revolution revolution and is now taking, you know, like a well-deserved rest. He asked Lewis to please put his trumpet down and, uh, and he photographed him and the photograph is absolutely magic that the setting sun in Death Valley is aligned precisely with Louis Armstrong's eyes. And, and it's like not, nobody had ever seen a photograph like that before of Louis Armstrong. That's because Art Kane pioneered this new approach to conceptual uh, environmental photography. Ditto with his picture of Lester Young, who he took to Rye Playland and photographed him reflected in the Funhouse mirror because he saw Lester's playing as being very fluid and stretching out notes. So he, he did a visual interpretation of how he, ima- how he saw Lester Young. Um, a ditto with his photo of, of, of Duke Ellington on the A-Train. I mean, Art Kane literally stopped the A-Train, stopped, had the New York City subway system hold the trains up for 20 minutes so he could crawl down on the tracks of, of an A-Train and have Duke Ellington standing in the front door of the front car, and and that is Art Kane's photograph of Duke Ellington. It's 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 a it's a powerful image. It's mostly black field of the darkness uh, of the tunnel, but with Duke Ellington standing on the A train that he immortalized in his song. And finally, his photograph of uh, Charlie Parker's empty sax case, which he had sitting uh, uh, positioned uh, above. Charlie Parker's tombstone in Kansas City, and they are um, sort of eerily the same shape, uh, a, a rectangular shape, but the case is open with no horn inside of it, and so it, it's just it's saying you know that the bird is gone, bird is flown, um, and so to answer your question, when this when this issue of Esquire came out, um, Art Kane's career basically took off like like a, like a, a rocket ship and and just went 
great guns from there. I mean, at that point, he uh, the phone didn't stop ringing, and uh, and he went on to become one of the uh, the top uh, five photographers in the world. It's fair to say for a good thirty five, forty years of his life. Quick question about the all the photos that have come in the wake of uh, of Harlem nineteen fifty eight. There's so many. Needless to say, the 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 great day in hip hop stands out, but but many photos, great day photos have come about and and what's your thoughts on those yeah well you know um it's uh, they always say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery mm-hmm. and and i think there's real truth to that um you know the the harlem 1958 or a kind of you know G- again gene box title of a great day in harlem this idea of the concept of the great day here and the great great day there has really become a kind of a phenomenon and a kind of a, a multicultural obsession. Uh, there have been great days in hip hop, great days in doo wop, great days in klezmer, great <laughs> days, which was one of the fun ones shot down at the Essex Street Synagogue. Uh, and actually, some musicians I worked with are in that picture, including John Zorn and Gary Lucas. Um, and then, uh, and um, so. You know, I'm I'm proud of them. I, I appreciate it when the people at least contact me and the archive first to ask, uh, you know, to sort of, you know, let me know they're going to do it. And uh, and then after that, it's like, you know, have at it because all it really does is to make the original photograph all the more iconic, all the more legendary, and all the more meaningful and important. I will point out too, just in, uh, that I I recently did my own great day. Uh, photograph. Um, I, I live in the borough of Queens, which is the most ethnically and culturally diverse uh, borough on planet Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, London claims to be, but it's not true. And all the statistics will show you that more people from more countries um, around the world live and thrive in the borough of Queens, New York City, than any place else. So um, being proud of that and that actually being a real attraction to why I, I moved here and just raised my daughter in this borough and just, uh, ma- so she grew up with kids from all over the world so I created uh, with the help of the Queens Economic Development Corporation I created a photograph called A Great Day in Queens I sh- I, we got the location in front of the Unisphere and we had uh, a group of about 166 people from about six 70 different countries around the world who live in Queens. Uh, we built a, a choir riser in front of the Unisphere to replicate the, the, the look of the stairs in my father's original photograph. And for me, what I was doing was two things. I was paying homage to my father's original photograph on the eve of its 60th anniversary. This was shot this last June, 2018. But more importantly, I was making a statement um, about the the uh, importance in America, especially now in this day and age, of, I was making a statement about the beauty and the poor importance and the true beauty of America in its embrace of immigrants and multiculturalism and how that that is what uh, ma- is so special about about Queens in particular New York in general and what really makes what really really makes America great right. and um, and then last but not least I can also say that if anybody had ever asked Art Kane to do this photo again in a million years, he wouldn't have put another group of musicians together. So (laughs) that gives me a little pat on the back from beyond for taking his concept and doing something else and making another kind of a statement. And you mentioned, um, the archive, do you run the, the arcane archive or what's the information on that? Yeah, I do. I do. And you can contact us at artcane.com. Okay. And, um, and, uh, again, Art Kane's career, uh, spanned, uh, generations and decades of influence in, in, in photography and, and certainly not just his iconic music, jazz and rock portraits, but also fashion and profound editorial statements. He had some really important images, uh, dealing with issues like civil rights and war, Vietnam war. And, um, and those are, that's the work I'm possibly more proud of um you know i I love i'm a musician i love his music photography is powerful and important but the statements that he made with the platforms of the day the most you know visible platforms of the day like life magazine look magazine you know where people really went to for their media and then these were 
very impactful visual messages that actually changed people's uh, opinions about things. And I'm, and I'm very, very proud of that. Great. Cool. Uh, Jonathan, can you tell us about the book? Is it out yet? Or is it coming out? Where can people yes, find the, it? Yeah. The book is out now. And um, it's on Wall of Sound Editions, and uh, we're doing uh, an in-store and book signing at Rizzoli at 1133 Broadway uh, on Sunday, December 9th. And uh, so the book, I think, would clearly mean it's there. I've heard it's at the Strand now, too. It's also available at all other uh, you know, fine um, online real retailers whose names don't need to be said right now, but you, you know what I mean. Speaking of the Borough of Queens, right? Speaking of the Borough <laughs> of Queens, yes. And, uh, and I should also find it's a wonderful book. We also have a, another really beautiful book made uh, with uh, Real Art Press that came out about four years ago that is, I mean, this book that's out now is a deep dive into Harlem 1958, and it's wonderful. Uh, but we also have a, a comprehensive career overview of Art Kane's entire photographic legacy that uh, was published about four years ago on, on Britain's Real Art Press. And that is another like uh, absolutely must have for, uh, for any, anyone in photography. Both Wait, of them. What's the name of that book now? It's called Art Kane. Okay. By the way, I, if you're not familiar with Art Kane's work, definitely Google him and look his work up. Uh, uh, just on a little personal note, when I, when I was a student at the High School of Art and Design way back when, um, I was told this to Jonathan earlier, I used to go up to uh, Art Kane's studio in the Carnegie Hall building and show him my high school portfolio pictures. And he was always very gracious uh, uh, and generous with his time and gave me some wonderful critiques. So, uh, Big, big fan of your dad's uh, work for a long, long time, and uh, I'm sure the book is a beautiful, beautiful book. Well, I appreciate it, and um, and and it is, and I uh, appreciate your, the time with you gentlemen and getting to talk about it, and uh, we celebrate Art Kane, but we also celebrate the 57 men and women who turned up at 10 o'clock on, on an early, hot summer morning to, to, to help Art Kane make history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, That's it. and take a look at the documentary too if people are interested. Yes, which is worth it. Um, yes, uh, and JonathanCain dot com for your work. Uh, in addition, uh, um, it's a Jonathan Cain photo. Jonathan Cain photo. Okay, yeah, right, we'll put that link. We'll put all the links on on our uh, show notes. But uh, thanks so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great it's having you on as a guest. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been really fun, and uh, appreciate you having me. Okay, that's great. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and we come back. We're going to be speaking with contemporary jazz photographer Clara Pereira. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the BH Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Okay, we are back. Clara Pereira is a Portuguese-born, New York-based editorial and documentary photographer who has a particularly good eye when it comes to jazz music and musicians in performance. Her work has appeared on Jazz PT, Sandy Brown Jazz, The Brooklyn Rail, among others. Clara's background is in graphic design, but it was with photography that she found her voice. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor. Nice to have you here. So, first question, why jazz? Why not gospel, country, or klezma? And what's, what's your connection to jazz music? Oh, you know what? This was kind of by chance. Okay. It was not, you know, that I was thinking to become a jazz photographer. After I moved to New York, a couple of years after I got married, my husband moved here with me, and he's a big jazz fan. Okay. So I used to go to concerts with him all the time. And sometimes, you know, I will just take my camera, and I start to get this you know, big archive with mm -hmm. these uh, pictures. So we decided to launch a website. Okay. So he's a jazz critic, uh, and I do the photography. I was going to say, it wasn't uh -huh. because you were so bored at the club <laughs> that you had to start taking pictures. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say that. But <laughs> <laughs> You're safe, it's just us. You can admit to anything. Exactly, here. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes it was exactly that. Or because he wanted, like, I want a picture of this musician. Yeah. Or, and then, you know, the archive start, I started building the, the, sure. the archive, and we decided, you know, why not put both things together and... Mm -hmm. There you so go. that was the reason. <laughs> and but you've grown to love it, I guess, I, a little bit. I uh, love it. Okay. I do. I mean, do you shoot rock and roll? Do you shoot other kinds of music or performance? Or? Not, not at no, yeah. not at all. It yeah. was just, just the the jazz. Yeah. It was all. It was also, you know, it was one of the reasons was to put the work out there because you know it was just sitting. Mm -hmm. 
in the in the computer. Uh, and the other thing was also because you know I was working, um, you know, regular job, not not in photography, and I was feeling that I was you know I was not spending much time with my camera, and I had to go you know just make it really go out and take pictures, and that was a great way you know to keep me busy uh, in photography too. And did you have any sense of kind of the, the legend of jazz in New York City and, and some of the, the, the performers the and perf- personalities and even yeah. the locations? I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the clubs now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, I lear- and I learned I learned a lot about it. I'm terrible with names, though. Uh-huh. But I do have the sense, yes, yeah. that, you know, the, it is here. Right. Like, you have to be here. Like, you can breed the jazz in here. And is Definitely. your husband Portuguese or is he... He's Portuguese, he is. yes. Okay, yeah. okay. So he likes the music, yeah. And yeah. what was the first club you went to? Do you remember? Uh, or do you, what was the first club you remember going to? You know, the f- I think the first one, it was not... I don't know if it was really a jazz club. It was a Roses... Roses or Brady? I'm not sure if I'm saying this correctly. Mm. It was a, a, a bar in Times Square. Okay. And Donnie McCarthy was playing. Okay. And this was kind of maybe nine years ago or something. It was a very, it, no, it was not. I yeah. d- didn't get it. I don't think. It, I think they played jazz, you know, often there, uh-huh. but it was not like a big jazz venue right. or anything. Right, right, right. But I think that was the first. Uh, concert we went to here. Gotcha. And have you gotten to know some of the clubs now? I mean, do you have favorites? And can you talk a little bit about shooting in a club compared to concert halls? And Absolutely. I prefer clubs. Yeah. It's more intimate. It's smaller. More challenging, though, Mm -hmm. for images Mm -hmm. because it's, you know, you don't have a lot of space to move. The light is very dim, it's very low light. Do you ever go in beforehand to look around to see what the lighting is like, or do you just no, go in? No, no, no. By now I know more, you know, I know the clubs now, so I know. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> yeah. they, are, they are tough places to shoot in. It's not they, photography friendly. It's not. It's not. You don't have space. Move. You can't move a lot because you can't be in front of other people during the show. Uh, and you can't distract the musicians. You can't distract the musicians. You have to be invisible. Pretty much. You have to be invisible. I pay very, you know, I'm very attentive if they playing you know really slow very right. piano i don't shoot during those times if it's like a slow a solo you know i just wait mm-hmm. although you, sometimes you miss a good picture absolutely but now mm-hmm. just to hold that thought do you what camera system do you use and do you have a silent shutter mode on your camera i, I use the quiet mode okay I d- yeah i do have a nikon a d810 okay and I use the quiet mode mm-hmm. a lot, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. But that's not so quiet. It's not it's like not, the Sony's it's or not Some of the new cameras are literally it's not silent. silent. Yeah. You could, yeah. No, it's not the same, but it helps. Okay. Yeah. It helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The good thing is like in jazz, sorry to interrupt you. The good <laughs> thing is it, it, it's like in jazz, sometimes I'll, you, you know, it, it's not so quiet, the music itself. So sure. it helps for the photographer. For sure, for sure. And what, what's your lens choice usually? Oh, I zoom lens. Mm-hmm. I have a 24-120, and that's pretty much what I use. Unless if I'm um, concert hall, yes, and I do like 70 to 100, mm-hmm. depending where I am. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I keep one lens, and so that's it. You said 24 to 120, 120, which is an f4 lens, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if you're it's stabilized, and you've got to really be careful yes. on that one. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. challenging. It yeah. really is. And you stabilize with just your, your arms and the table and whatever you Just, can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't drag around tripods. Or <laughs> no, or even no, monopods tripod. are just nothing. Nothing I'm wondering nothing if like, like a table-based monopod or something like that that you could Not work, if, yeah. No, but because I like to move. Mm-hmm. I like to move a lot. Even if, I'm, even if it's a very small space and I just have to be sitting there yeah. for the entire concert. I, I move a lot. Yeah. Like I will bend almost my head to the floor or <laughs> so I can't have anything just on the table. Right. Now, mentioning that, did you get your head down to the floor to get that right angle? Yes. You were a graphic designer before you came here and became a photographer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay? correct. Your photographs are very carefully composed and designed. Thank I mean, you. So, yeah, there's, it's not just snapshots of people playing instruments. They're mm-hmm. very carefully thought out. Um, the compositions are great. We well, might have just a little ahead the bottom of the frame. The rest of it's just dark. You play with positive, negative spaces, and basically you create tension in phrasing, which is what music is about. Yes. And are you consciously aware of that when you're doing it? Uh, I am a little. Yes, I am a little bit. Uh, I, I think in the beginning I wasn't, uh, but you know when you go back and edit your images and you start seeing this pattern. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And yes, there is a lot of the graphic design, the composition, and the negative space, as you were saying, that I really do pay attention to it. Mm. Especially because, you know, in concerts and in jazz, there's a lot of stands sometimes. Everywhere. Yeah. There is the mic stand and the stand for the papers and this and that. So you really have to find different angles and different compositions that, that you're not going to have all that noise. That's what I was going to ask. Is it often a product of necessity because you do have these odd angles and it, things blocking you? Have you. To. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. You know, they do sell these really large pipe cutters at the hardware <laughs> store. You could just, you can get those out of the way real fast. <laughs> there won't be really... Sometimes, it felt, <laughs> sometimes you're so close to the stage that you want to go there. And just, you know, move it, move yeah, it yeah, a yeah. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> or shadows you, of microphones. I mean, that geez, you just yeah. lost. The shadows are terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. But are you usually going as a customer? You, you, I mean, you buy a ticket, you get a table or a chair, or do you go that's, with a press pass? And That's a good question. That's yeah. how we started. Yeah. That's how we started. We used just to get the ticket and go. Mm-hmm. Um, after we we started, after we put the website out, um now we ju- we go as press. Okay. Yeah, we get uh, we get the press comps and, and to is cover. M- can you talk a little bit about the differences? Because there are some advantages of being a customer where you can just kind of chill, find your spot, maybe get a good table that you know has a good angle, and then of course there's advantages of being a you know having the ability to move around and people know who you are and, and that. Much better to have the press. Oh the, yeah. <laughs> yes. And do you introduce yourself to the musicians before and, no, and no. do anything like I that? I don't no. talk with anyone. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they didn't even know I'm there, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. After the show, sometimes I do. Mm. Um, I just talk to them and, uh, mm. you know, we we'll let them know we're covering the concert or, right. but not before, never. And what about reaching out afterwards with the photo? Do you often send it to the musicians and, and try to make an arrangement then or a relationship? That we, you can we do. Uh, yeah, I do. So, uh, most of the time, th- we, if we're covering, if we're going as press, mm-hmm. we usually, you know, it, it comes out like a review of the concert mm-hmm. with a picture, with a gallery. Right. With, a f- you know, 15 pictures to, to 20 pictures more or less of the concert. Okay. And we do, we, we post it on social media and we send it to the to the PR, mm-hmm. uh, to their PR, or to, to right. them personally. Right. Yeah. And has that uh, benefited? Has there been a- anything that's come from that in terms of uh, work or them, the musicians using your images and things yes. like that? Yeah. Sometimes that's how it works. Yeah. So it's not it's not that you're gonna have the you know the assignment before like you're gonna get money before. Right. It's kind of you're working on spec all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it does uh, often, yeah. Uh, when they like the pictures, they, they reach out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, usually they want to use it for press kit or, right. yeah. Right. And maybe getting back a little bit to the lighting in, in the clubs, which is obviously tricky. How Do you do you try to play often with the spotlights and, and use the backlighting and as much as you can? Or do you ever do any of your own lighting? Would no. You, okay, that concert. I assume you wouldn't do. Not in concert, no. Not even flash. No, yeah. you don't even... <laughs> Yeah. And if it if it's like a you know um, a bigger place like Lincoln Center, you mm-hmm. will have like they will give you like ten minutes. Mm. The first ten, ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Sometimes in, in festivals too. Yeah. But yeah, no lighting whatsoever. Mm. No. So they will give you a few minutes at the beginning of the of the set, and you can do your work then. You can then, do, and that yeah. that's. And it then seems you to be the rule sit, at a lot yeah. of concerts, also in general right now. They give you like this 10, 15 minutes tops, yeah. and then they get you out of there. They don't want you there at they all. They don't want it. Yeah, that's mm. why I also. That's why I like small clubs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because <laughs> you have more time. But uh, as I said, I'm very you know, I, even if I'm losing a good picture, if it's a quiet moment, I don't. You know, yeah. I, I'm just, I'm waiting, I'm, they're doing their work, so I have to respect, respect. that too. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, uh, maybe a technical question. When we are in the dark, dark spaces with the bright lights, what do you usually set your camera in terms of the ISO and do you, how, do you, how fast do you usually shoot in your shutter speed? Oh, God, I play with the shutter speed, a l- but, yeah. it, but it's a very small range. Mm. I'm between 1 over 60 mm-hmm. to 160 sometimes, mm. the top. Mm-hmm. And that's pushing the high ISO. Right. Well, when you pushing say pushing the, the ISO, what, do you, go, what numbers going, are you, to, well, what to, number are you yeah, talking about? I'm talking like 5,000. Mm. Okay. And for me, that that's really, I try not to go overboard. And also, you know, I like my pictures with a lot of contrast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really, you know. Uh, Your stuff, there's a lot of saturation. Yeah, there, it's just, a lot of, so I don't mind if they come a little bit um, underexposed. Yeah. So. A lot yeah. of your pictures have light from shadow. They're very. Yeah. Yeah, very much that way. Mm-hmm. And what about the idea of, okay, as Alan was kind of saying before, it, 
here's just a photo of a guy or a girl playing their instrument. How do you try or what do you think about when you're like, I, I need to do something different. I mean, I need to get a new angle or a new expression or something. And, and what do you do when that's the case? You know, that's mostly kind of, it's on them. Yeah. It's on the musicians. Uh, it's up to you to catch it. It, it's, it, it is. It mm -hmm. is. I usually spend, you know, like the first music and sometimes a little bit more just watching. Mm -hmm. Just to get a sense, you know, of their interaction, of their mannerisms. You know, the, the mannerisms on stage. Sometimes they're very quiet, mm -hmm. which is not great for photography. Yeah. They don't move a lot, or their expression doesn't change. But you, I just wait and see, you know, if they, you know, what they're gonna do. It, the mannerisms that you were saying, mm -hmm. and you go from there. And does that influence the type of photos you're gonna take that day? Because I mean, I, there are yes. many of your photos where it is a quiet moment, where it looks like the the musician is maybe listening to another musician play. And if you see someone who's kind of, you know, more wild on stage, you're going to... I'm going to focus more on that person. Yeah, I spend yeah. more time it, uh, to really try to get the best picture. Mm. But, uh, but you're right. Sometimes it's the, it's the quiet moment. It's when they step out of stage or when they sit down for a break. And that's the best picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not only when they're playing, it's when they, you know... Mm -hmm. Performance they, and downtime. But exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes that's, that's the best yeah. one. What about that classic, you know, the, the like the, the the musician in the zone face, you know, when they're in the <laughs> middle of their solo and stuff like that? Oh, that I mean, that, that's the best. Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, that's the best. If you can get it without if you can, distortion yeah. and exactly. funny faces and exactly. things like that. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes funny faces, you know, sometimes, and I get the sense that some they may not like it, you know, they're doing, but it's just that moment they they are giving it all, and you know, it's right there, mm -hmm. it's right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> and and what about like being becoming invisible? Do you? I mean, you've kind of spoken about this already a little bit, yeah. but do you find you know your tricks that you use to to kind of you wear sneakers? You do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I'm just, quiet shoes. You have to be quiet. Dress dark, in black. Yeah. Dress oh, in dark black. clothing. Sure. Dark clothing. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Always, mm -hmm. always dark clothing. Yeah. Very quiet. And I'm very aware of myself. Mm -hmm. And even like we're saying the quiet the quiet mode in the camera. But I can hear it all the of time. Course. So I'm always thinking that everyone can hear it. Yeah. And no yeah. one, you know, mostly people don't really pay attention, but I can hear it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very conscious of it. You yeah. become a component of the performance in a sense, just you, as much the person who is at the control board. You're part of that too. You're part of the system. You're part of the... But, because you, know, you don't want to take away anyone else's experience of it and you're trying to capture the experience at the same time. Exactly. But I think... But that lives, I think, more in my head... I don't think they really pay attention unless, you know, I'm right if on their If you're doing face. your job, they're not paying attention I don't to you. think they are, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I'm doing it well. <laughs> but but you were right. But it I think it leaves more with the photographer than that you're really aware of where you are if you're going to move the chair, you know. You have to be totally sensitive to everything you, around you. Totally. Yeah. You, you know, you have to wait, you know, maybe to let them finish this this music and then Do move to, you, to, yeah. another, to another spot in the... In the venue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what about with singers? Because that's a whole, that's a different, a little bit of a different vibe, I, I think. Uh, I don't know. Obviously, being silent is equally as important. Then, um, but it somehow seems that with singers, there's a, even more of a um, a barrier you don't want to break when when they're when they're performing. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It, and that's funny because we don't have we don't do a lot of of singing jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do we do few actually. Yeah, yeah. But but that's true. And I do mostly you know in festivals and you know uh, large venues. Mm. So maybe because I can stay more you know back. Yeah. Would yeah. a sing do singers in general make more eye contact with the audience than say a, 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 a someone playing an d instrument per se? Depends. I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know if that's depend depend on. The, I think they all they always depend on the musician. Yeah. Uh, but they tend to they tend to interact more. It's true. They, they talk more uh, with, with the audience than right. than just uh, mm. just. I'm not saying just like yeah. <laughs> it's less. <laughs> <laughs> and do you shoot on continuous ever? Like just kind of blast away, no. or you don't? Like to Never. Do, yeah. do you shoot? I mean, I, I know. Given what we said already, I imagine you don't shoot that much. You know, compared to some other type of photographers, or would you? I I, do, I don't, but I. Sometimes I do more than a, you know than I think I would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because you're also trying to anticipate a lot of very subtle gestures, movements, and expressions. It is. So you have to be, and quite often you think something's about to, and you might push that button and it never quite happened, but 
if you didn't push the button, you wouldn't have it at all. Absolutely. You, that's exactly what happens. You just, you're just paying attention and you're focusing all the time. It's like I spend the time focusing, <laughs> yeah. getting to prepare to that moment. And sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't get it. But you are really anticipating because they change the, their position or the, the mood changes. or And you just want to be ready. You want to be in focus. You want to... So you can you you live in that viewfinder for that period. That's it. Always. It's manual. like watching a cat fixated on a bird. Kind, yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. You, you just watch. The, that's yes. what you're doing. You're just waiting for that. But yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know. And it's funny that sometimes I spend like I'm, I I feel that I'm so long looking just for this you know this musician in particular, and I don't know what is happening in the rest of the stage. You're in the zone. I'm in, yep. I'm in the zone. And maybe I'm missing other pictures, but I'm, you know, I saw something, I'm just waiting. Or for the shadow to move out, out of the face, and I'm just, I'm, it's like the cat. Yeah, I'm just yeah. standing there and yeah. waiting. Yeah. And manual focus, usually? Just when the light is very, very, very low. Mm-hmm. When I can't really focus, out of focus. At a certain point, that you, yeah, yeah, the sensitivity is not there. It's not there. Yeah. And then you, then you have to, but most of the time, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most of the time, it's just out of focus and okay. recompose all the time. So you kind of, I move a lot, like I said. So you I'm, hold focus and then recompose. I hold focus and yeah. recompose yeah. a yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I do often. Yeah. So I wanted to get back a little bit to the, this club scene in New York. Uh, do you again? Do you have a favorite place that you oh, like I'd to never work? Answer to that, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm kind of curious because I, you know, I, I'm not as much as I used to, but I used to, you know, go to tons of jazz clubs and, and I have my favorites. And so. He's not allowed in a lot of them. It's, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. it's true. Ben. <laughs> I do. You know, I like I like the jazz standard mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. The the lighting is good. Yeah. Uh, most of the stage, there's always, you know, these dark spaces that yeah. you can get to, but uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good place. The background is great, mm-hmm. simple. Mm-hmm. I like Cru- Cornelia too. It's a hard, you know, Cornelia Street Cafe? Yeah, sure. It's very, it's very small. It's yeah. very hard to work yeah. I- uh, in there, but I like the ambient yeah. and how, you know, how intimate it is, even with the musicians because they, it's so tight yeah. Yeah. that they have a kind of, I feel they have a different relationship on stage when they're playing. Have you um, been in the 55 bar? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. But that's really hard. Sure. 55 is, is hard. Yeah. Because? It's hard to, be, because you're really on top of the musicians, which I like, but the light is very, it's very difficult. Ah, uh, okay. It's, it, there is no spotlight. Right. Because that happens sometimes, like the, it, it's, the lighting is not, not great. It's usually not great, but mm-hmm. you have like the spotlights or, and the 55, it's, it's like this even, yeah, you know, like the very room dark, lighting, right? yeah, yeah, room lighting, yeah. very, very low. Yeah. So it's harder because you don't have, kind of, you can't create like a big contrast or, so it, it's hard. But I do love the space. Yeah. By the way, they do sell lenses with apertures wider than F4. <laughs> I know. They really do. I know. <laughs> but they're really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like... I guess now that you're into this thing, have you looked back to some of the the jazz legendary jazz photographers? Do you kind of follow the the craft, or is there anybody else that you like and oh, whose work you, you follow? Yes, Roy yeah. de Carava. He has mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. He yeah. has amazing. Mm-hmm. And I guess it, what attracts me is it's like the you know that strong light and yeah. that contrast. Sure. Yeah, it, it's using the, the darkness. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting. Uh, there, there is yeah. there is so many, but yeah. but like I said, because it was not. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a jazz photographer because mm-hmm. I'm used to see these pictures. I actually, you know, I didn't photograph people at all before. And my biggest influence was, you know, Maria Ellen Mark. Yeah. And John Lifton, who pushed me to start photographing people. Mm. And it cha- ev- changed everything yeah. in my in my work. Cool. But it, So it's not, it doesn't come from a... Um, a the, musical the, place right, uh, specifically, mm-hmm. but yeah. how you interact with people and trying to capture that essence that we're talking, that the right, the right expression, the that right moment. What about? Uh, and I should ask this a little earlier when we were talking about the clubs, but working with the 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 bartenders, the wait staff, and all the people that are there, have you found that it's important to make a nice relationship with them so that they? Yes. It is and, and that, out of your and way the, or whatever you want to. Yeah. It is yeah. absolutely, and that's also that's why press counts as mm. well. True, because if they are where you're working, they you know they won't bother you or right. they, they we 
they won't get you on you, you know uh, on your space too, and that's helpful. Sure. That's also very helpful. Have you had people say no photos or musicians ask not to take pictures or anything like that? No, if I go, no, if I go as a press, right. n- never, right. never. Right. Be- I had that be- a lot before. Right. Yes, like as a if you go customer. to Villain Vanguard uh, mm-hmm. and you're not press, that you can't, oh, you can't, let you they don't let you shoot at right. all. Right. 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 So, which is a hard lighting too, but good, but very good, and very good. If venue. you, if you, with your press pass, do you you call ahead of time and you say, I'm, and I'm working for such and such a website, or I have a, an assignment, or even I'm self assigned, I'd like to come in and shoot. And they get back to you and say, okay, and they put you on a list or yeah, how's it that happens. Work? It happens in both, depend. Sometimes I do that. Like mm-hmm. I, I, we, there is a certain concert that I really like uh, to get into and to take pictures or we like to cover for the website and we, co- we contact the head, mm-hmm. the, the PR or the musician and we say, well, you know, we want to cover this concert and if you agree, mm-hmm. they will give you uh, the tickets. Or is the PR or even the musician that contact us saying, you know, I would love you to to get this concert on the website, mm-hmm. so and they will right. make make uh, that that offer. Right. I guess are the musicians accessible? I mean, it's not like the the you know the s- jazz stars really don't exist much anymore. There's a few old timers, mm-hmm. I guess, that you might call a star, but uh, are they generally approachable they and easy to deal with? I think they are. Mm-hmm. I think they are more easy to deal with. There are a few that mm-hmm. you can feel, you know, right. that they are in a different. Uh, Level, if I can say that. Right. Uh, but most of them, or even those that I, you know, I photograph um, Charles Lloyd, for example, mm. in in my hometown, actually, oh. uh, in the festival, and I'm a big fan of him. Uh, so I wanted just, you know, to introduce myself, and he was very, very friendly, mm-hmm. uh, very nice. So it was everything that I expected, because right. sometimes that, you know. It's not a good feeling if you have all these ideas yeah. <laughs> about someone, True. then you meet them, and it's not. Yeah. It's not. It was everything that that I expected. Yeah. So. And is there anybody that you really want to photograph and you haven't had a chance yet? Uh, is there any legends or mm-hmm. not even legends? I guess. Oh, there are a few people that would love to do like a more uh, portrait session. That was session. my next question. Uh, yeah. 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 Not 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 in cons- uh, Charles. I would love to. Who? Charles Lott, for example, oh, we love okay. to, f- yeah. not just, th- there are a few, uh, Bill Frizzell, mm-hmm. and I don't even say if I'm saying the name correctly. Yeah, um, yeah there are a few. Mm-hmm. Donnie McCousin, mm-hmm. because he's so expressive on stage that I think he could be also a good uh, person to photograph mm-hmm. as a, in a portrait session. But yeah. Do you do much in the way of formal portraits with lighting? I do, I'm not a very, you know, heavy technical person. Uh-huh. But what about in front of, say, you know, just but available light yeah. in a studio type situation yeah, or out a, of the club? In a stu- if, when I, if it's like a portrait session or a group session for their, you know, uh, outdoors or in studio, I'm very careful uh, with the lighting, but I'm not like crazy, you know, that I have, I don't need like 10 mm-hmm. lights or, uh, but I'm careful with it. And, and I'm more careful to understand what the musician wants. Or to understand his music, what he wants to translate with him, with his music, to see if I can put that in an, in a photo. Well, that's what the difference is because when you're photographing it during a performance, they're performing; exactly. they are doing what they exactly. do, the essence of what they're about. But when you take them out of that and you sit them down in a studio or on a stool or standing, at that point, now, now, now you have to create something. That they, are you, you comfortable go more, with that? I am, and I like it. Ah, okay. I do like it too. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Maybe it's going back to design. Maybe that's the part to create the yeah. concept, to create an idea that who is this person? Right. What what is the music that he he or she wants? You know, what is the message that they want to put it out? And how I can put this in a picture, how I can create a picture around this same idea mm-hmm. that is going to say, you know, this is this musician. Right. Or, right, right, and right. it's out of the context of, it's out of sitting the con- and playing. And it's sitting, and sometimes it's not even about the instrument or, right. you know. But it's funny because they tend, the musicians, sometimes they don't like to take pictures without the instrument. Sometimes I feel, yeah. Yeah, Dep- depending, depending on the person. I'm, mm-hmm. I can't say all of them. but yeah. Yeah. And do you have a, a favorite Type of musician that you like to shoot? Drummer, saxophone player? Not really. Piano? No. Make any difference? No. Yeah. No, I think it's more about the the person itself than, yeah. than all the, yeah. Right, right. So right, it right. depends more on their personality right. and what they're willing to do too. Because yeah. sometimes people come with this fixed idea 
you know. Yeah. I would like my picture to look like this, or I think this is a great idea. And sometimes it's not, mm-hmm. or we will not translate well in a photo. Yeah. So I, it, you can. It's yeah. about control. Some people ha- have to yes. have total control of what gets out there. Oh, absolutely. And some people do it very well, and some people don't do it very absolutely. well. Absolutely. No, you do. It, you're totally right. You have to have control. You, and sometimes the best way is like kind of you give a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, and you just you know this is what you wanted or. You show a little bit, mm-hmm. and then you do your thing. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Get, and give you, them what they want. They say, and okay, then, now and then you show. You know, uh-huh. let's try this. Um, now let's try this, and and you're gonna see the results, and let me know what you think. So, and and often, you you know, if you're doing well, you will you you get mm-hmm. the results you want. Well, it's like going back to cancer. If you give them a few treats, then you could put the tick <laughs> treatment on their necks. Yes, it's the same deal. Okay, it's a <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's pretty. Good. <laughs> Pretty good. You got to lure them in. You got to give them, a, you know, an incentive. Here's some treats. Okay, now you have your treats. Okay. How about um, <laughs> uh, how about women musicians? I, there's not. I mean, I know there's some singers, and on your website you, there's a couple of you know female singers. But how yeah, about but musicians? There are musici- yeah, there are musicians too. Yeah. It, okay. it, it's it's interesting that you see you know uh, the large number. Yeah. It's it's male. Yeah. But they are more and more, and they are being you know. Uh, I, I don't even want the word to say. No, it's not coming out. But you know they are there, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you can find them. Right. Like the, a couple of months ago, we we covered this festival uh, in Azores, mm. uh, in Portugal, right. and it was a large band uh, from New York, uh, Brooklyn, I guess, and they they had uh, a lot of women. Uh, yeah, but isn't good. it true it was, about all genre of music that it's mostly male dominated? It's mostly male dominated. I, be- I would I say so, so, right? I believe so. I don't think it's as I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to put the word in there. Right. I don't I think know. The only experience. exception might be country western, where both the male and female both complain equally about infidelity. I think <laughs> <laughs> that might be. Uh, tell us a little bit about the because you keep referring to the website, and I guess this is the with you and your husband yes. and his his work. Can you yeah. tell us about that a little bit? Oh yeah, v- well that's you know it, it became like you know it started like. Um, a very casual, you know, kind of, you let's put to work mm-hmm. for, you know, mostly for friends and very, you know, casual, informal way right. of doing it. Uh, and it grew, you know, it has like three years and a half now, but it, it grew so much that now that, that that's pretty much all we do. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. And it, what kind, And it's, it's his writing and your photos is generally the It's his the writing, yeah, 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 but yeah. He, he reviews albums right. and concerts. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I'm just photography. (laughs) (laughs) So after all these years, have you grown to love the music, like the music? Yes. Uh, Has it changed a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, it did change a lot. But I have to say that sometimes I really love it. I really love the concerts. Mm -hmm. I love the experience. I love to see them playing the music. And sometimes I don't listen that at home. Mm -hmm. It, It. it's interesting. The visual like, and the, the and, and I guess it depends. Like my husband, of course, he will li- he will listen mm-hmm. for hours and hours. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a different, but uh, you know. Is but he, I do. Is he a I musician do, also? Is he? He, he does play guitar. Does yeah. He? Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> so if people want to see more of your work, where should they go to? They can go to jazztrail.net. Okay. And they can go also to my website, cladapadatafotography.com. Okay. And both of these sites will be on our Explorer page. Show notes, sure. Show notes, so you can check all that stuff out. Um, and uh, I highly recommend it. It's not just the jazz photography, but there's a lot of great photographs on there all together. I, we could do a whole other show on those. Maybe we will sometime. Um, if you are not a subscriber to the B&H Photography Podcast, what you're waiting for? It is free, it's informative, it's fun, and it contains zero sugar, trans fats, or calories. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, and you can always find us on the B&H website, Explorer. For now, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today.